This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, a 73-year-old woman is dead after Friday's explosion at a senior's home in Sydney. On strike, faculty at Mount St. Vincent University take to the picket lines after failing to reach an agreement with their employer. And Swifty Super Bowl. Taylor Swift fans in Halifax celebrate the Chiefs' victory. Spring-like across the province today. Not so much over the next few days as the nor'easter tracks in with snow and blowing snow. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. The local state of emergency in Cape Breton Regional Municipality is now over after the area saw historic amounts of snowfall last weekend, up to 150 centimeters. But now they are bracing for even more snow. Meanwhile, a family member has confirmed to CBC News that a 73-year-old woman has died after heavy snow caused a propane explosion last week at a seniors complex in Sydney. The incident occurred at Silver Birch Manor on Reeves Street at around 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. The woman was initially taken to hospital with serious injuries. About 60 people were displaced from their homes. Some are staying at a hotel, others with family and friends. Photos from the scene show a large hole blown out of one side of the building. The CBRM officials are waiting for a full report on the incident, but fire inspectors believe they know what caused the explosion. It's happening because the heavy snowfall amounts are sliding off roofs and um, some of them the loads are landing on the lines the connection for the propane damaging the lines causing a leak uh, and we believe it's still under investigation. Yeah, March says the fire crews have responded to a number of similar incidents in the area since the snowfall. Meanwhile, Premier Tim Houston says the province has sent more help to Cape Breton to deal with the continued snow cleanup and to help with the next snowstorm. We've mobilized people to make sure we're assessing provincial infrastructure buildings. We've asked municipalities to do that as well, and we asked residents to do that. But there are, you know, there's additional resources being deployed now. There's more Team Rubicon people coming. There's more resources going to the impacted areas to make sure we can get to those quicker. Houston says crews have worked 60,000 man hours since the storm started and have covered 23,000 kilometers of road clearing the snow. CBRM Mayor Amanda McDougall says she is grateful for all the help her city has been receiving. We were talking about, you know, 30 centimeters thinking, okay, that's not too bad compared to the 150, but how, how horrible is that? Or that's our standard now, but no, listen, our public works teams have been working 24 seven since the first flake fell last week. And they're continuing to do work to widen, to increase access, to move snow in preparation for the snow that's coming this week. So um, we have more people here supporting us and helping us with uh, snow removal efforts and, and community support than ever before. So I, I feel like we're in very good hands. I'll talk to Mayor McDougall about what's next for her city as another winter storm bears down on the province. That's our Newsmaker interview just after 6.30. And once again this week, all eyes on the weather forecast. Mm, Ryan, what is the latest? Well, winter storm warnings have been issued to Tom and Amy, and winter storm watch is also in effect just on the northern edge of this system. And it is going to be a very sharp gradient between who sees a lot of snow and who sees not next to nothing. And again, it looks like most of Nova Scotia is going to see impactful snow and wind, but there's still some uncertainty with this system. There are the warnings and the watches just on the northern edge. And in terms of the snowfall totals, again, still some uncertainty here, but it looks like southern Nova Scotia, the Atlantic coastline up into Anaganish, Pictou counties, and then into Cape Breton. That's our best chance of being near 20 centimeters to as much as 30 centimeters of snow. And those amounts will drop off quickly as we work our way to the north, but again, impactful. And should mention as well, Cape Breton, the Northumberland shore, onshore flurries and snow squalls developing Wednesday night into Thursday will bring some additional totals, most notably to Inverness County and back into Anaganish. So this is kind of a developing system over the next few days quiet right now. The storm itself is just gathering steam. That's one of the reasons the forecast models have had such a difficult time nailing down the track of this one as it will be skirting just to our south. Better confidence in the arrival time of this Wednesday afternoon from west to east arriving in the metro area 
just in time for the drive home, but expecting a pretty snowy and wintry commute uh, for you folks. The South Shore, Shelburne and Yarmouth counties as we move throughout the afternoon and into the evening. Halifax really getting into that snow and blowing snow more so through the later stages of the commute home tomorrow. And then we're all kind of into the meat and potatoes of the system Tuesday evening into the early overnight. Note the snow and the blowing snow. The winds are going to be gusting with the system widespread 60, 70 and yes, could even see some gusts upwards of 80 kilometers per hour along parts of the coast, most notably into Cape Breton on Wednesday morning when it does look like we'll see uh, definitely winter storm conditions here with snow and blowing snow. This thing will again depart the system itself as we move through Wednesday. But again, those onshore flurries and squalls will linger into Thursday with snow and blowing snow continuing to be an issue, Tom and Amy. So the combination of the snow and the wind is really going to be what uh, stands this one out in terms of impacts. And we'll obviously keep you posted throughout the day tomorrow. As I said, still a little un more uncertainty than normal with this, but uh, does look like it's going to be impactful. Mm, sounds like okay. it could be messy. Okay, thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Thank Ryan. A strike started today at Mount, Vincent, uh, Mount St. Vincent University. Full-time faculty, librarians, and lab instructors walked off the job. As Gareth Hampshire reports, they're fighting for better pay and more diversity at the university. The strike starts at around noon with those joining the picket line carrying signs focused on respect and fairness. They say they feel bad for the students, but say they're taking this action to try to make things better. We never really wanted to be here, though, and we would hope that this doesn't last long. The association says pay for the 160 full-time faculty, librarians and lab instructors needs bringing in line with other schools in Atlantic Canada. And a big reason for the strike is because of what they see as a lack of action around ways to better reflect the university's values on equity, accessibility, diversity and inclusion, such as hiring and retaining more Indigenous and Black scholars. The more we can do to break down the barriers for faculty, that's critical for us. We want them to stay once they get here. We want them to stay and we're, we've already lost some black scholars. Some students held a sit-in inside the university in solidarity with their professors. Because I'm an affected student by this and quite frankly because I am very frustrated right now with the Board of Governors. And then joined the picket line. I think it is good to have more like equity and diversity because a lot of like marginalized people it's like harder to be in a classroom and it's great that our profs are trying to like make sure it's like easier for us on the issue of pay the university disagrees with the union saying staff are about in the middle compared with other atlantic universities on equity and diversity issues the university says it does not disagree with a lot of what the union is saying but needs to work out the details because what's important for us is being able to implement these terms consistently and fairly. So we're really into the negotiation of the details, not about the values. The university says it wants things resolved quickly. It says the campus will remain open and expects classes taught by part-time instructors to continue. We know that some classes are impacted, um, but we do care about our students and their student life experience, and we want to, uh, to reach an agreement as soon as we can. Both sides say they want to keep negotiating to try to get an agreement, but the association says it's also prepared to continue the strike for as long as it takes. Gareth Hampshire, CBC News, Halifax. Prospective teachers in Nova Scotia will soon be able to apply to education programs at Nova Scotia universities after just two years of undergraduate study. Right now, a full bachelor's degree is required. Premier Tim Houston announced the change at the Progressive Conservative Annual General Meeting this past weekend. The education minister says schools are facing a labor shortage, though she could not say exactly how many more teachers are needed in the province. You know, at this time, we, we know that we're, um, our population is growing. We know that it will continue to grow. It will grow more. So um, we'll be doing that work to, to understand uh, the workforce um, requirements. But, but we know that this is important work now, um, not only to create a pathway for folks who want to become teachers who are in Nova Scotia and um, getting a Nova Scotia education, but, but just to make sure that it's clean and clear um, for anyone who's interested. The minister says there is still much work to do with the universities and the teachers union before the new criteria will take effect, but she is hoping it will be ready by this fall. The NSTU says it has not been consulted on the changes. 
Rural transit providers in Halifax are getting a municipal funding boost for the first time in 10 years. These nonprofits help people get around outside the transit boundary. They recently asked for help to keep up with rising gas costs, and council agreed. Haley Ryan has that story. Elizabeth Beaver gets into a Musco Rider van, as she does most weeks. Without this, I'd be lost. As a senior on the Eastern Shore who doesn't drive, Beaver says she relies on Musco for medical and grocery trips. I really enjoy going with them. They're always so courteous, friendly, helpful. They drag my groceries for me <laughs> up the steps and into my house. Last week, Halifax Council raised its funding model for Musco Rider and two other services for the first time since it began in 2014. Our a rural transit uh, service has been, uh, well, I think a huge success since we introduced it, but they have had been having their own uh, uh, operational pressures, especially with the price of gasoline and stuff. The flat rate is going up nearly 30% to 64 cents per kilometer, and lump sums are jumping between 10 and 30%. I think it's great. <laughs> they understand how important we are to the communities and to the people that live there. Besides seniors, these services drive people to work and help those with intellectual or physical disabilities get around. Greeno says this will help Musco keep fares low while increasing trips. Because we are fully booked, like people are now calling like two weeks ahead of time and we can't fit them in. So there's a real need to expand. Bay Rides in St. Margaret's Bay asked for the funding increase a few months ago. It's really just keeping us on the road. Harris says their numbers of low-income people tapping into a reduced fare program have risen 200 percent, up to about 100 trips a month. So it's not insignificant um, for an organization our size and in the St. Margaret's Bay area as well. Both groups have invested in greener vehicles to help save gas money through the Federal Rural Transit Funding Program. That includes hybrids and for Musco Rider, a new Tesla, their second electric vehicle. Very fun. It's, it's kind of like driving a cell phone. They're also building a heated garage to plug them in through the winter. So I think it's really important that Nova Scotia is really a leader in rural transit. Mm. They've seen the need. You know, we're innovators here. <laughs> Both groups are now hoping the province raises its funding, which also hasn't been changed in years. Haley Ryan, CBC News, Porter's Lake. Scientists and fishermen are trying to figure out why swordfish off Canada's east coast are being found in large numbers further north than usual. An increasing part of the fishery has moved to the Grand Banks and Flemish Cap off Newfoundland. Paul Withers explains. 2023 was a banner year in the swordfish business. 1,900 tons caught, nearly a third off Newfoundland, much of it by fishing boats from Nova Scotia. A rapid shift from the previous decade when the entire Canadian catch was off Nova Scotia. I think what's really interesting when we look at the data from Newfoundland is that for every, say, thousand hooks, we're seeing many more fish and we're seeing larger fish. What's not clear is if it's the result of a warming ocean or a cyclical and temporary event. Swordfish were caught in Newfoundland years ago. We suspect the fish have always been on the Grand Banks. Um, just that, you know, it makes no sense to steam four days and have the extra expense if you can fish in your own backyard, so to speak. The shift has coincided with the collapse in landings in the harpoon fishery off southern Nova Scotia over the last three years. The fishery relies on the fact swordfish normally surface during the day. One question is whether they are basking less because of warming temperatures below the surface. Scientist Kyle Gillespie not sure why this is happening. It's, it's really unclear if this is kind of a, a new normal due to climate change um, or whether that biomass is, is going to shift back again south uh, as we think it did historically. Um, so, so this is something that we're trying to figure out. Gillespie tried to attach satellite tags on swordfish off Nova Scotia last year to track their movements but could not find a single fish on the surface. Itself remarkable. This year the tagging operation will move to Newfoundland. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Newfoundland and Labrador's tourism minister is slamming a Super Bowl ad seen around the world last night for its use of an iconic Newfoundland and Labrador song. The province says they have received innumerable complaints about this. 
This looks like an actual farm. It looks cute on the app. <laughs> Yes, that's Eyes the Buy in a verbo ad showing people surprised by, let's say, lackluster accommodations. The local reaction to the ad was swift and in some cases negative. People online called the ad disgraceful, disrespectful and derogatory. Some say it mocks a traditional song. One calls it an attack on Newfoundland culture and music. And another accuses the creators of taking one of the province's most treasured tunes and associating it with dirty poultry. Well, speaking of the Super Bowl, last night Kansas City beat the San Francisco 49ers to win the big game. And Taylor Swift fans were among those watching to cheer on her boyfriend, Chiefs Travis Kelsey. Here in Halifax, a group called Atlantic Canada Swifties put together an event to watch the Super Bowl. Over 70 people were there dressed up, making friendship bracelets and even learning about football in honor of their favorite singer. Everybody here is in such good spirits. Everybody's having a great time. So basically, we had a couple Swifties reach out asking if we were going to do something for Super Bowl. It was totally a last minute plan, but about a week in the making, it turned into just a big Swifty hangout to watch the game and watch it somewhere that the Brad's dads and Chad's weren't at. So we didn't want that like haters going to hate vibe. We wanted the fun, inclusive Swifty vibe. My father grew us up watching the Super Bowl. So like I am familiar with the Super Bowl, but I never actually like watched it myself really, uh, just for the halftime shows. But uh, I, I, now, I now really get the pull and I think this will continue. I'm a big Chiefs fan now, weirdly, but yeah. So were you a football fan before? Definitely not, no, not at all, not at all. We've watched every single game this season. So as it built up to Super Bowl, it was like, can Taylor make it there? Oh, there's Taylor. It was just the fun of it all. We're at Moxie Halifax Hotel. So we have a photo booth in one area. We have friendship bracelet making, TVs in three different sections of the hotel so that people can spread out, have fun, watch the game. We have a station that people can pick up bingo cards, which is for football bingo. Basically, it's things like, is Taylor going to get shown on screen? Are Taylor and Travis going to kiss? What's going to happen through the game? Is Jason going to take his shirt off in the box like he's known for doing? Honestly, it's that connection. Wives will now watch football with their husbands when they typically wouldn't. Daughters are wanting to watch with their dads, which is a fantastic vibe. Like, it's just, it brings that connection together. And Taylor is a connector with her lyrics, but now connector with sports as well. I think there is nowhere else I'd rather be than with this group of people. And um, I just look forward to more, hopefully, Super Bowl parties and excitement and Taylor-themed events. Over the next little bit, we want to expand across Atlanta Canada for more events, bring some Taylor fun events there, and that's basically our goal from here on. I'll keep watching football until Taylor's not on the football. <laughs> okay, looked like a good time. The Halifax Library has come up with a creative and interactive way to learn about the legacies of historic black figures during African Heritage Month. Lego lovers gathered at the Captain William Spry Library over the weekend to piece together a tribute to civil and women's rights advocate Viola Desmond. Each participant was given a template to follow and once those pieces are complete, it all comes together to create a finished Lego mosaic. Organizers of the event say it is a fun, interactive way to learn about the culture, achievements and important contributions of people of African descent. Well, because I play with Lego uh, <laughs> on a semi-regular basis, I was thinking of a way to incorporate it into an African Heritage Month program, and I found some templates online, and also Sean from Halifax Bricks did a template of Viola Desmond for us, which was really great, um, because we had Jackie Robinson, we had an option to do Martin Luther King, but wanted something in the African Nova Scotian uh, African Heritage Month figures as well, and so that was a great contribution, and that's what we're working on today. Last week, they also built a Jackie Robinson mosaic. Both will be on display in the lobby of the library throughout African Heritage Month. As we head to break, a sad note to pass along to you now. 
CBC producer and former producer of this program, David Pate, passed away suddenly. He had a long career with CBC in both TV and radio, in front and behind the camera, before retiring in 2020. David passed away on Friday. Our thoughts go out to his wife, Gemma, and their three children, Rebecca, Abigail, and Alex. Well, I suppose meteorology is tough enough uh, <laughs> in this part of the world for sure, but this yeah. last little strip, stretch that we've been on. Yeah, we've been watching Ryan just pour over all the charts. Grayer and grayer and grayer. <laughs> uh, Preston Mulligan was coming by the desk today, and, and he was saying, what are the worst two storms mm -hmm. to try to predict? <laughs> Cut off low, had that last week, yeah. Yeah. and then a nor'easter like this one, mm -hmm. which is tracking to the south, and the snow on the northern edge drops off dramatically to the north. And yeah, the, again, the models have just been shifting on that track back and forth. Um, and I'm not alone when I see memes from my fellow meteorologists in the Northeast US 
with computers thrown in the dumpsters <laughs> and that type of thing. It yeah. uh, makes me feel... You haven't gotten that far yet. That's right. I'm feeling a little bit better that we're all in this together. And I know that folks are hoping for mm. a southern trend, which I think if we see any trend now, it is going to be further offshore. That seems to be where uh, it's edging, but not confident enough to change my forecast as of yet. But stay tuned for forecast updates tomorrow mm -hmm. before the first flakes fly. Uh, hard to believe we're talking about this, given the forecast today. Nine degrees at Western wow. Head, eight in Halifax. Balmy. We had some melting, huh? We had some melting, even in Sydney, which of course is uh, key. We want uh, more melting there. Four degrees at uh, Sydney, six in Yarmouth. And yeah, you can see even uh, towards the north, uh, two to four degrees picked up and into Anaganish. Now, temperatures right now have uh, started to back off, obviously, uh, in the northeast in particular, still holding on to the three to five degree range in the south. And yeah, there are those warnings that are in place from Environment Canada, and we've got the watches in place for Cumberland County and across into uh, Inverness and Victoria counties, kind of on the northern edge of this system. And the system itself is right here and through the U.S. southeast. And yeah, this is, again, going to be tracking northward with that snow on the northern edge. So you can imagine uh, with millions of people in the crosshairs of the potential snow of this and a changeable forecast throughout the day today from New York to Boston, Philadelphia, these are all places uh, that uh, could be impacted by this one. And it has been a, a crazy day for sure as a forecast the forecast models continue to shuffle with the projected track. But again, we'll show you uh, what we know. And uh, as we move forward for our forecast tonight, minus four to minus six, uh, minus five to seven across Cape Breton. And note the winds. I've got the gusts on here as well as the clouds and the precipitation. So nice light winds to start the day tomorrow. It does ramp in, uh, ramp up uh, from uh, west to east. And it looks like it's going to arrive for the 101, the 102, the 103, these metro area highways, and of course the 103 running further south down towards Lunenburg, but uh, this is where we are most likely to see that snow arriving in that 3 to 6 p.m. time frame. You folks down in through the Shelburne, Yarmouth, Digby County areas edging into the valley, expect to get into that snow a little bit earlier in the day. Uh, we are looking at winds becoming northeast, gusting 50 to 60 kilometers per hour in the southwest, gusting to 40 through the Halifax area, increasing clouds. The snow holds off until tomorrow evening for you folks in Cape Breton. Note again, the heaviest snowfall is expected to stay to the south. I mean, at one point it was looking like 30 plus centimeters was a good possibility with this. That is no longer the case. Really, it's kind of the, the medium to light bands of snow that we're going to be in the mix with here and where they are. A bit further south, a bit further north is why this is, again, a tough one to nail down. Widespread gusts, though, 60, 70 kilometers per hour. So even if we're on the lower end of the ranges, the blowing snow is going to be an issue Tuesday night and into Wednesday morning across the mainland and in particular here across Cape Breton. Blowing snow is going to be a factor not only for Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night rather, but throughout the day on Wednesday, even into Wednesday afternoon and evening. So again, looks like near 20 to as much as 30, uh, although trending towards that 20 number a little more here uh, towards the, the last uh, couple of hours. Uh, but sticking with the forecast for now, but do stay tuned for updates. 10 to 20 uh, across northern areas again looking like it's going to be closer to 10 here, uh, but we will keep you posted tomorrow. And again, those additional totals uh, for Wednesday night into Thursday for you folks in Cape Breton because of the developing onshore squalls here, especially for Inverness County and Aganish into Pictou counties here. You folks getting into this secondary uh, snowfall with that onshore flurry and squall action. So keeping an eye on that over the next few days as well. The mainland will get back into some sun on Thursday. Uh, flurries back in the mix for Friday and Saturday with temperatures kind of cooling off towards the weekend as well. That's the other kind of trend towards the towards the weekend. But uh, yeah, we'll get through this uh, nor'easter first and then we'll uh, settle up on that. Constantly yeah. being tested, it seems, right? Indeed. You can do it. You bet you can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, now to Sabangadagadi, First Nation, where the CBC's Sismahan sat down with Mi'kmaq elder and medicine person Brian Joe Francis. As they unpacked a medicine bundle, they spoke about how climate change could affect traditional medicines. Have a look. Now we're going to start with the uh, chaga. Chaga here. And how the climate is affecting the uh, medicines. And now in the long-term part and short-term part, there's 
On the long term part, it gradually going to affect certain in certain medicines. But there's always a medicine that uh, that we already have does the same thing and it works. There's usually a lot of it around. Usually, yeah. but a lot of people notice how it's being uh, taken away, sort of thing. Yeah, because of all that clear cutting they're doing and all that stuff, how it affects the uh, land. They say, oh, we had a flood. Why did they have a flood? They did all that clear cutting. Oh, we don't have this medicine anymore. Where is it? All oh, washed out to sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is climate change that can affect a lot of the medicines that way. And we have to be made aware of the change and what we can use and what we can't use. Yeah, there's a nice container for uh, for your willow, though. Yeah. Red true. willow, you usually get that in the... Uh, just when it turns spring-like and you'll see the redness in the um, bark. Well, there's some people that are, they, they put up gardens and everything that they'll go to a, uh, go into the woods and pick certain plants and start a garden and then to uh, kind of replenish that part of, that part of it mm -hmm. for themselves. But there's a few of them out there that they share it too. And it doesn't work as good, but i.e. the effort is there. Yeah. Yeah. To try to replenish. And there's the, uh, the almighty tobacco. Right. Yeah. Tobacco is used in a lot of the. Uh, ceremonies to uh, open doors, open the uh, doors for the uh, spirit world. So what advice do you have for youth who may be feeling overwhelmed just looking at the future, especially indigenous youth? Yeah, to uh, go to an elder and ask questions. It don't hurt to ask. That's the way I look at it. You, mm -hmm. you have to ask. And that is Brian Joe Francis. Up next, I'll talk with the mayor of CBRM about getting ready for more snow expected to hit the province this week. That's our Newsmaker interview. Please stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
With what seems like mountains of snow still being cleared in CBRM and more to come in the forecast this week, the city is rushing to get as ready as it can. Extra equipment continues to arrive from around the region to help clear out residents. Amanda McDougall is the mayor of CBRM. Ms. McDougall, I'm wondering how worried you are about this approaching weather. Yeah, so it's I was talking to one of my, my council colleagues and we were talking about, you know, 30 centimeters thinking, OK, that's not too bad compared to the 150. But how how horrible is that? Or that's our standard now. But no, listen, our public works teams have been working 24 seven since the first flake fell last week. And they're continuing to do work to widen, to increase access, to move snow in preparation for the snow that's coming this week. So. Um, we have more people here supporting us and helping us with uh, snow removal efforts and, and community support than ever before. So I, I feel like we're in very good hands. And fingers crossed, maybe it'll be less than 30 centimeters, although I gather it's going to be windy and that could cause drifting and all sorts of its own mm -hmm. problems, I'm sure. The province says it's, it's sending resources. I, is there enough? Do you have enough equipment now? Yeah, so, you know, you can turn any corner here in the CBRM uh, across our community and see so many different types of machines out there working. Um, folks from outside of Nova Scotia are here. Uh, we've got even our local contractors here uh, involved in this as well. Um, not to mention, you know, I, I popped into the Incident Command Center that is at the Hampton in Member 2, where EMO, Natural Resources, Team Rubicon, Grand Search and Rescue are all there coordinating and deploying to help people. So um, it's it's truly remarkable how this has all come together. And so at this point, what do you need? Well, we need Mother Nature to uh, help us out a little bit. I mean, the last couple of days of sun has really, really helped as well. There's been a lot of snow melting, um, but really we just need to keep going um, and, and, and keep those resources here um, as we dig out again. Your state of emergency has been lifted or expired. I, mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that everyone is dug out at least at least sort of to some bare minimum or to some extent? No, no you know, we still have people, um, especially, you know, in those county areas where you have folks living on private roadways or laneways. Um, and so we're, I'm seeing the requests come in and say, look, it's been six days and we're still waiting uh, in the queue to get the big machines out there because our normal plow person just doesn't have equipment strong enough to move all this snow. Um, you know, one of the natural resources folks I was speaking to this morning said they took a helicopter out to do a food and medication delivery. So there's still there are still situations where people are stuck. How big of a concern is snow loads? I'm thinking in tops of buildings and that kind of thing. Oh my goodness. It makes me nervous thinking about that, but it also makes me nervous thinking about the people that are up on their roofs right now trying to move that snow before more comes. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot. I mean, we've seen there was a business here in the downtown area who, because of the snow on the roof, the ceiling started to crack and cave. Um, wh what happened with the snow that fell off of the seniors complex causing that horrible explosion? This is all very, very real. Again, I'm really grateful for all of the work, the clearing that's being done, but um, it is absolutely it's essential that we get more more support by way of folks who can come and help us with the, that assessment, that structural assessment of buildings, and, and then actually bring in the skilled experts to do that snow removal, because standing on your roof with a shovel is very, very dangerous. So who do you want to see supply that kind of help? Is that, is that the province or the feds? How would yeah. you see that going? So, both really. Um, so we sent a request for assistance out earlier this week asking for uh, that type of support. We, we don't have that as a municipality. Um, and so those conversations are happening right now, both at the provincial and federal level. Any lessons learned from this storm as to how you would handle things in the future, how things might or could be done differently? Well, I'll say this, um, you know, I am so proud of our teams here. Um, the way that everybody just rolled into their, their roles, into the EMO roles and um, took care of what had to be done immediately. It just shows that unfortunately we're very skilled at dealing with emergency weather events. Yeah, getting good at it, I suppose. Uh, Amanda yeah. McDougall, thank you so much. No problem, take care.
Coming up, Canada's Auditor General says the final cost of the controversial Arrive Can app is impossible to determine due to poor financial record keeping. Welcome back. Individuals involved in the contracting, development and implementation of the ArriveCan app ignored basic management practices. That is according to Canada's Auditor General Karen Hogan, who also says Canadian taxpayers paid too much for the pandemic era app. She presented a scathing report to the House Public Accounts Committee today. The CBC's David Thurton has more. This multi-million dollar app wasted tax dollars according to the Auditor General. Overall, this audit shows a glaring disregard for basic management and contracting practices throughout ArriveCAN's development and implementation. Her audit laid the blame on the Canada Border Services Agency, the Public Health Agency and Procurement Canada. Travelers were required to use ArriveCAN during the pandemic's early days. It is still used for immigration declaration forms, but remains controversial. I have to say that I am deeply concerned by what this audit didn't find. 
Hogan's audit found very little information for awarding GC Strategies an uncompetitive contract. Record keeping was so bad that it was hard to estimate the app's final costs. Estimates peg it at nearly $60 million. According to the Auditor General, if the government of Canada had done this kind of IT work, it would have cost an average of $675 a day. Instead, with ArriveCan's contractors, it costs almost twice as much, nearly $1,100. In no way are we going to defend this particular contracting process. The minister responsible for the Canada Border Services Agency says that every single recommendation will be implemented, but also shifted accountability to the CBSA's head. She is taking all of the appropriate steps to hold anybody to account in the case of alleged wrongdoing, but also to ensure that this kind of circumstance can never be allowed to happen again. The Conservative leader blamed the Prime Minister. Won't he stand up today and admit that the app is just like him? It's not worth the cost, it's not worth the corruption. Yeah. The Auditor General stopped short of calling this corruption. She left that to the RCMP, which is investigating issues across the CBSA. But she did say that this is some of the worst financial record keeping that she's probably ever seen. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. The Israeli military says two hostages have been rescued from Rafa in southern Gaza. The freed men had an emotional reunion with family members near Tel Aviv. <laughs> Israeli officials say the Israeli Argentinian men aged 60 and 70 were being held in an apartment building in Rafa. They were taken during the deadly attack by Hamas militants on October 7th. Special Forces soldiers stormed the area, backed by airstrikes during the operation. At least 67 Palestinians died during the raid, according to local officials. Meantime, Western leaders are increasingly expressing concern as the Israeli military targets Rafa in a new offensive. The border town with Egypt is home to more than one million displaced people fleeing the fighting. Many Canadians have been complaining of a nagging cough, sometimes days and weeks after a bout of viral infection. Unfortunately, for most cases, there are no quick fixes, and it usually subsides with time. But as Lauren Pelly finds out, a cough lasting beyond eight weeks may need attention. <coughs> Canadians know the feeling, a cough that just won't quit. I still have it. <laughs> Yeah, it comes and goes. I do normally wait it out myself. Uh, if it were to last for weeks, though, I would definitely go into the doctor. Usually, um, you know, home remedies. So like hot water, you know, mixed with turmeric. That's what we do in our culture. So what's the best way to tackle a nagging cough? While well, a trio of doctors writing Monday in the Canadian Medical Association Journal say when a cough follows an infection, often it's just a waiting game. We look through the evidence of what can be used to treat or stop a ghost infectious cough. And the answer, surprisingly, is time and patience. This family doctor says he's only talking about cases where someone had a known viral infection beforehand, like a cold or the flu. Most of the time, the patient's own cough will resolve on its own without any medication or treatment. But it lasts a lot longer than you think, anywhere from three to eight weeks in total. <laughs> But if a cough lasts beyond two months, it can signal a deeper health issue. Physicians say other red flags can include coughing up blood, shortness of breath, wheezing, or difficulty swallowing. In those cases, conditions like asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, or even whooping cough could be the culprit. And you might need treatment like an inhaler or other medications. If the cough has been persistent for up to six to eight weeks, um, then at least to do a basic chest x-ray to make sure there's no underlying serious underlying lung disease. Doctors say getting a proper diagnosis is important, but for most run-of-the-mill coughs caused by a virus, there's not much they can do. So the advice is just wait it out. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. An Ontario man's dream home had it all, except enough heat to keep him warm in the winter. He had to live in frigid temperatures for months after a builder installed a furnace that was too small and failed to do anything about it. Rosa Marcatelli with the CBC's Go Public Unit investigated. 
the floor is freezing, so we have to turn it up. When the weather turned cold, William Lobodici found himself layering on the clothing and constantly cranking up the temperature in his brand new dream home. And it was still chilly. As an expert, they know when they installed these appliances that they weren't going to work. So why go ahead with it? The air conditioner installed was also too small for the job. About 20 of Lobodici's neighbours faced the same problem, according to the city of Hamilton. Complaints to the builder, Starwood Homes, went nowhere. I mean, they're even admitting, yep, it's undersized, yep, it won't work. And, uh, sorry, not doing anything. Same thing from the HVAC company, Reliance Home Comfort, who said they just installed what the builder told them to, says Lobodici. There's really fundamentally a lack of adequate consumer protection. Despite government promises of a home buyer's bill of rights almost two years ago, Canadians are still waiting. Ottawa tells Go Public consultations with key stakeholders are done and will soon share the results. At the centre of this is Canada's building boom and the problems it's causing, says this advocate. But there's a shortage of labour, there's a uh, shortage of municipal inspectors. It, it, the whole system is fraught with problems, unfortunately. The city of Hamilton tells Go Public they knew the furnaces and the air conditioning units violated building codes, but let it slide while working with the builder to correct it since July. That's news to Bob Fraser, one of Lobodici's neighbours, with the same problem. They knew about this problem, but they put it into the background and said, we'll deal with it later. After Go Public inquiries, the builder said they're working on a solution. At the same time, Reliance Home Comfort, the HVAC company, replaced the furnace and the air conditioner for both homeowners and some of their neighbors. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Vancouver is known for majestic mountains and sparkling water, but another attraction has been turning heads lately and all the locals can say is, oh rats. John Hernandez explains. A late night feeding frenzy caught on camera. Throngs of rats, a nightly occurrence outside a downtown Vancouver SkyTrain station. We were like looking down the stairs over there. We saw just like a bunch of them. Oh, it was kind of gross. I was like, oh shoot, I have to walk down that way. Those are big rats. Those are lots of rats. Norwegian rats and, and roof rats. Right here we're looking at one rat hole and we're looking at several others. Metro Vancouver's self-proclaimed rat detective says this is a perfect rodent hangout. And we're at a busy station, right? There's going to be food around that's readily available, so there's lots here to allow them to thrive. Exterminators say rats are reproducing at a fast rate across the region. This exterminator is rattled by the number of calls he's been getting. We're getting rat calls in places we never really got that many before. And usually by the time the clients know it, it's an established population. It's not one or two, we're looking at, you know, seven or more. He blames the unseasonably warm weather and a recent ban on rodent poisons on the apparent boom. But this researcher says a lack of data makes it difficult to know for certain. You know, we don't have a system to encourage people to call for that purpose anyway. We'd need to set it up. A reporting system that's existed in Alberta for decades and produced stunning results. And we have a zero tolerance for rats in the province. Alberta, one of just a handful of jurisdictions on the planet considered rat free. You know, if you walk down an alley in Calgary, you wouldn't see rats coming out of a dumpster. A goal unlikely to be achieved in these alleyways anytime soon. With a network of tunnels running across this city, residents in Vancouver should brace for more rodent run ins. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver.
For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. All right, now we have more snow on the way, but I'll bet you the uh, Ryan's pick is being filled with, still, with snow picks yeah. from the past storm. We, we've had a little bit of snow to photograph. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, when the snow combines with uh, a beautiful sun pick mm. like this, uh, have a look. Uh, this one coming from Cape Breton. Uh, not surprisingly, in this area, again, Inganish Beach, it looks like it was one of those spots that saw around 90 centimeters, wow. maybe even more. That's crazy. Nice any time so of year nice. in Inganish, yeah. honestly, isn't it? That yeah. That's just wow. amazing. Beautiful, beautiful shot. This was taken by Lindsay Witte and sent in by Maureen Singleton and just a fantastic shot. We can just leave this up for the next <laughs> It looks like it's on fire, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. I like that better than this yeah, picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too much a blue and cold on this one. better, for sure. So it looks like, again, uh, probably closer to 20 than 30, but that is the range right now for the southern parts of of Nova Scotia. Stay tuned for updates on that. And again, northern Nova Scotia, likely closer to 10 than 20. But uh, again, we will keep you posted with uh, any adjustments here with the as things progress. Be mindful that this will track in for, to southwestern areas tomorrow. But again, the meat and potatoes of this for most tomorrow evening into the overnight. So mm -hmm. timing out kind of nicely that way. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned, as they say, right, Ryan? Yes, sir. All right, Paris is a city of light, and crowning it is the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, but don't try lighting this Eiffel replica. It's built from matchsticks. Mm. 706,000. Creator Richard Plo aimed for a Guinness record tallest matchstick structure. He spent eight years finishing on the date that Gustav Eiffel died. After all that, Guinness rejected it. But last week, a happy ending Guinness, Guinness changed its mind. The issue partway through construction, Plod started using uh, special matches, uh, but uh, yeah, they accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> Worthwhile, I guess. Yeah. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. Good night.